Hello! I hope you are having a fantastic day. Welcome to Law & Looks, where I smoosh together law and makeup to talk about some of the more interesting cases that I learned about in law school. Quick disclaimer, nothing I say can or should be construed as legal advice. I cannot give you legal advice. If you need legal advice, please obtain your own attorney and seek counsel from them on any particular matter. Today I am super excited because I have the Venice Fling Palette by Bailey Sarian and Estate. As you guys know, I was inspired by Bailey to start this channel, so I was very excited when this came out. I got it with my Ipsy bag, and I haven't used it yet, so this is the first time I'm going to be using it. I've looked at it and looked at all the colors, but I haven't put it on or touched it yet. And to go along with this palette, I decided that today I'm going to do one of, I think it's the most interesting murder case that I learned in my criminal law class my first year of law school. Today's case is called Her Majesty the Queen versus Dudley and Stevens. Ooh, I need to do my eyebrows. This case does come with a couple of content warnings. One, there is a violent depiction of hunting and eating wildlife, and also some depictions of murder and cannibalism, so viewer discretion is advised. Our case starts out in 1983 when an Australian lawyer by the name of John Henry Want buys a yacht. I guess even in those times lawyers had a penchant for boats. I hate boats. I went on a cruise once and absolutely hated it. I don't like the fact that you can't leave the boat. Anyway, John Henry Want is an Australian lawyer in Britain and he is generally looked down upon by British society, so he thinks buying a yacht and bringing it to Australia will make him look more accomplished or prestigious in Australian society. The yacht that he buys is pretty small and it's only meant for like inshore sailing. I'm not sure what that means entirely, but basically it's not meant for long voyages. And this man wants to sail from England to Australia in his yacht. And his yacht is not meant for such a journey. So it takes him about a year to get together a crew. His crew consists of Tom Dudley, the captain, Edwin Stevens, Edmund Brooks, and Richard Parker. Richard Parker is the least experienced of the entire crew, and he's only 17 years old. He lied to get onto the crew by saying that he was 18. Here's a bit of a haunting fact. About 50 years earlier, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a novel, his only novel, called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. And in that novel, a man named Richard Parker is stabbed to death by his shipmates who are starving after a maritime disaster in order to eat him. And here we have a Richard Parker as well, going on a sea seafaring journey on a ship that's not meant to go on the seafaring journey. We'll see how it turns out. So the crew sets out and about halfway through they hit a really terrible storm and unfortunately the ship is totally wrecked. Now Tom Dudley is extremely experienced and he realizes during the storm that they are SOL and so he has the lifeboat lowered and all five of them are able to get on the lifeboat. But they're lost at sea in the late 1800s. They have no way to contact anyone or get rescued other than to kind of hang out on this lifeboat with dwindling food supplies, no water, hoping that a ship passes them and rescues them. On their first night on the lifeboat, they had to literally fight off sharks with their oars. By the third day, they were completely out of food. And here comes the wildlife hunting part. So they knew that they could not drink the seawater. They knew that drinking the seawater would be fatal, so they needed some way to get water into their bodies and they needed food. About, I think, four days from when they got on the lifeboat, Brooks spots a sea turtle. Stevens drags the sea turtle on board and they all completely devour the sea turtle and they were planning on drinking the sea turtle's blood because that's how they could get a pure form of water into their bodies that was not contaminated by high levels of salt. <coughs> 
but the blood got contaminated by seawater, so they were unable to drink the blood, although they were able to eat the turtle. The turtle lasted them about a week. They were unable to catch any sort of rainwater, and so after about, I think, 10 days on the lifeboat, they started drinking their own urine. At some point, it's thought that Parker decided to drink the seawater and got extremely ill. At this point, the men are desperate. They don't have food, they don't have water, they don't know when they're going to be rescued. So they discuss drawing lots, drawing straws to see who should maybe be killed and eaten. Dudley is really pushing this. He's an experienced captain. He knows that this is pretty customary on the waters. If you ever get shipwrecked, it's considered a necessity to kill one of your shipmates and use them as food and drink the blood for water. So Dudley raises this option and Brooks flat out refuses. He's like, absolutely not. I will not be doing that. At night, which is, they've probably been on the lifeboat for about 19 to 20 days at this point, Dudley raises the option again and Stevens is like, all right, let's do it. Stevens also points out that Parker is probably the closest to dying. He's likely in a coma at this point. And Parker is also the only one without a family or kids to look after. Dudley and Stevens then decide to table this conversation until the next morning. The next morning, with no hope of rescue in sight, Dudley and Stevens signal to each other to kill Parker. Brooks doesn't seem to have protested, but doesn't seem to have agreed to killing Parker either. Dudley always maintained that Brooks agreed to the plan, but that day, Stevens held Parker down and Brooks pushed a penknife into Parker's jugular vein, instantly killing him so that the remaining men were able to eat Parker and drink his blood. Simply waiting for Parker to die a natural death would not have been sufficient because then they wouldn't have been able to drink his blood. The crew was rescued about four or five days after that. There's some evidence to suggest that when Parker was being killed, he murmured slightly, what, me? So he might have been conscious and aware of what was going on. Just incredibly macabre all around. It was an extremely unfortunate circumstance and still really eerie that there was a novel by Edgar Allan Poe that also had a Richard Parker who died in order to be eaten by his shipmates. Weird. Like I mentioned before, this type of cannibalism was a custom of the sea. It was completely normal, even though we find it really icky and macabre to think about. The reason we learn about this case in law school is because while it was accepted practice at sea, and the law generally turned a blind eye to it, when it happened, this case was used to establish a precedent that necessity was not a defense to murder. So even if you are in grave danger of dying from starvation, that does not allow you to murder someone else to eat them. The reason we have such a good account of this case is because Dudley spilled his guts, figuratively, not literally, on the way back to Britain after the crew was rescued. This is likely because one, he thought he was protected by the custom of the sea, and two, he was probably incredibly delirious, didn't know what was going on, and was like, oh my god, we just murdered a guy in order to eat him so that we could survive. I think this case really sticks out because society has a weird obsession with cannibalism. It's so deeply repugnant to our thinking of a civilized society and we're so caught up in the fascination and fear. It's just so ugh, to think about. But cannibalism the actual act of eating human flesh isn't illegal in the United States, or Britain for that matter. There are other laws that make it really hard for you to get human flesh to eat, but the act itself isn't illegal. Generally, when you think about it, when there is a case of cannibalism, the crime focuses on the murder aspect. Kinda, I wanna do gold on this, on top. I think that'll look cool. Let's do a little, a little speckling of gold. There is a lot of dark humor and jokes about cannibalism. This case itself inspired poems and ballads and jokes, even by well-known writers like Byron, like Byron and Thackeray, but it was considered a normal way of life, that that was a hazard that you undertook 
an assumption of the risk, if you will. So even though Dudley and Stevens were found guilty, Brooks didn't go to trial because Brooks didn't go to trial because there wasn't evidence that he participated in the murder of Parker. Even though Dudley and Stevens were found guilty and sort of used as an example to change the policy around murder and cannibalism for shipwrecked sailors, there was a lot of public sympathy for them, especially after Parker's brother came and visited them. The judge in this case decided to show them mercy by only having them spend six months in jail. Brooks ended up being a witness in the case, and then he went on to attempt to make a living as a participant in the different types of freak shows that depicted the macabre and dark humor of cannibalism. He wanted to be the real life example in those types of shows, and as a live exhibit in museums which I thought was really interesting. I'm not sure what happened to Stevens. The pans are so big in this palette that one, it's fantastic that you get so much product. Two, I'm definitely gonna try and use tan lines as bronzer and what's this one called? Bonfire as blush. I think those will work wonderfully and I love a multi-purpose palette. Where was I? Oh yeah, Dudley ended up moving to Australia and was extremely prosperous as a ship outfitter, but he unfortunately died when the bubonic plague hit Australia. Now this case has also attracted a lot of mainstream media attention. There's been a Monty Python sketch based on it. The Life of Pi Tiger was named Richard Parker. It's of course taught in law schools where law students take extreme fascination with it. There's also a really famous philosophical legal thought experiment by a Harvard law professor called the Spelunkian Explorers and it kind of takes bits and pieces from this case and you go through your own thought experiment about the moral, ethical, and legal quandaries of killing one of your teammates, so to speak, when put in such a dire situation. I finished talking about the case before finishing my makeup. Give me one second. And that, my friends, is R versus Dudley and Stevens, the cannibal case from Crim Law. Thank you so very much for watching. I really really like the Bailey palette. My eye makeup is not my favorite. Like I said, I do like that the pans are so big. I think the shimmers work best when used wet, but other than that, I think it's a really pretty palette. The mattes are very nice and pigmented. Bonfire is so pretty. Like, so so pretty. Anyway, I'm very happy that I got this palette. And I'm very happy that you are still here. Thank you very much again for watching. I hope you found this case as interesting as I did. And I will see you next time. Bye!